Welcome, everybody. I'd like to begin with an acknowledgement of country. So tonight I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri people who are the traditional custodians of the land we are meeting on today. I wish to acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and the contribution they make to the life of this city and region. What a great turnout. Um, thank you. We are oversubscribed in the room and we have, I think, more than 200 people joining us online. So an indication that there's a great appetite for this conversation, which is, uh, which is really terrific. So thank you all for coming uh, and for participating. Uh, there are too many of you to really call out individually. We've got two very special guests who will join us for uh, the conversation after we've heard from, from Ross tonight. But I, uh, there is one person I would like to, to acknowledge, and that is uh, Paul Simon. Hi, Paul. Thank you for coming. Uh, former DG ASIS. Uh, excellent. So um, I'd like to welcome tonight Ross, <laughs> Ross Babbage. Sorry, Paul. <laughs> Um, Chief Executive Officer of Strategic Forum and author of this uh, this truly excellent book, uh, Selling at the Back. So, hopefully, you'll uh, you'll, you'll be able to grab a copy. Um, the next major war: Can the US and its allies win against China? And also, welcome to our two special guests tonight: uh, Senator James Patterson, Liberal Senator for Victoria a very thoughtful and well-informed thinker on the relevant issues that this book raises, and the Honourable Kim Beasley, Distinguished Senior Fellow at ASPE, among many other tasks. Gee, Kim, you must be busy, uh, and whose long and storied career speaks for itself, but very clearly and obvious and importantly, uh, a former Defence Minister. Um, so they're going to join us for a conversation about, you know, what the book raises and, and some of the issues that, that Ross talks to after we've heard from Ross. Uh, so I will bring him up very soon um, and he'll give us some comments and then we will we'll proceed. A quick intro to Ross so you understand just how well credentialed he is to write a book like this. Uh, not only, as I've mentioned, is he CEO of Strategic Forum Limited. Uh, if you don't know what that does, it is a not-for-profit organisation committed to fostering high-level discussions and debates on the primary security challenges confronting Australia and its close allies. Dr. Babbage served as a special advisor to the Minister for Defence. I think that was you, wasn't it? The other. The other, okay. <laughs> um, look, and he, uh, he was instrumental in preparing the 2009 Defence White Paper. He served on the Council of the International Institute for Strategic Studies in London for the maximum six year term. He was an Australian public servant for 16 years, holding many positions, relevant positions in, uh, in government, including in ONA. Uh, he led the branch in defence responsible for ANZUS policy and importantly and relevantly for this conversation and for where we need to go with talking about the defence strategic review. Um, he was responsible for force development in the department at one point too, and that had responsibility for all the analysis um, of major defence capability proposals, preparation of advice for, for committees of cabinet and defence internal committees. Now to the book. This is a really important contribution to the debate and to the growing understanding of the threats that Australia faces and the increased risk that we face of war in our region. It's the kind of book we don't often see from Australian authors. I commend it to you for its comprehensive approach and its comparative assessment, something few have tackled, but which is so clearly important. A comparative assessment of the systems of China and the US, how they respectively think about strategy, how they mobilize for, prepare for, and may ultimately prosecute war. The worst case scenario, of course, is that we end up in a large scale kinetic conflict. Thinking about the worst case is the responsible is the responsibility of all people in defense. Um, and really, as, as we head into this, this new era and we think about implementation of the DSR and the upcoming national defense strategy, it is really important that we grapple with the hardest questions, but the most consequential questions. It's a compelling read. And it's illustrative of the importance of getting past the tendency that we all have to mirror image, to see the world through our own eyes in the context of our own systems and our own experience. Understanding the other is the best way to effective deterrence, and it's the only way 
to an effective war fighting strategy. Ross, may I ask you to come up and, and walk us through your book? Thanks. Well, thanks very much, Beck. Uh, let me say it's a delight to be here. But I must say, Beck, uh, following an interview, uh, an introduction like that, even I'm quite looking forward to what I might say. Um, so very special thanks to Aspie uh, for hosting this special launch. Um, and it's a, it really is a great pleasure to see uh, the group that are here, many longstanding friends and many others who I um, look forward to meeting when we, have, when we break. Um, right up front, I just want to thank also the team from Paper Chain Bookshop out the front, um, you know, uh, who are ready to sell you a copy of the book if you really want to get one. Um, and they've worked hard, uh, more hard than, harder than you might think, to actually get boxes of the books into the country and in, in here uh, because it was, of course, published not in Australia but in, in New York um, so that you can actually access them. So please make the most of that if you can. Um, it's a special honour today. Uh, to be joined by Kim Beasley and Senator James Patterson. Now, they've both got an enormous amount to contribute on these issues and uh, I look forward very much, and uh, I'm sure you do too, to hearing their thoughts in just a little while. And special thanks to all of you for joining us uh, for this special event. I'm grateful that you've taken the time um, to be here and I know at least a couple of you have travelled uh, over, from overseas uh, to be here tonight, and a special thanks to you. And a special welcome also to those who are joining us uh, online. I also want to express my heartfelt thanks to the many colleagues who contributed to earlier phases of this project by strongly encouraging the research, by providing high quality advice, and providing in special closed workshops the t and, uh, an opportunity to test draft judgments. Now, these highly skilled experts contributed a great deal to this project, and I'm exceptionally grateful to them for it. And supporting me in every step of the way actually has been my wife, Lynn, who's sitting up the back there, trying to be a little inconspicuous. She contributed exceptional research support, um, patient editing skills, and much else besides and I'm delighted that she's able to be here tonight. Well, let me ask, why would anyone uh, want to write a book about a possible future war in the Indo-Pacific? Well, let me share briefly the six main reasons why I decided to spend almost three years researching and writing this book, and I'll be introducing a few of the themes in the book on the way. The first main reason for writing is that the more that my colleagues and I examined the topic, the more we realised that a major war in the Indo-Pacific would be a huge disaster. It was obvious from early on that we must do everything we can to prevent such a war. We certainly need to boost our deterrence capabilities, but if we are forced to fight such a war, we must ensure that we don't lose. Indeed, we must do our very best to win. Now... Let me just flick on. So. A second key driver of this book was the realisation that major war between China and its friends on the one side and the United States uh, and its allies on the other is a very serious risk. There is now a strong possibility that we will need to fight such a war during the coming decade. The main reason we are in this perilous situation is Xi Jinping's repeatedly expressed determination to seize democratic Taiwan. And he has made this a core promise to the Chinese people. And he often states, and I quote, we will never allow anyone at any time to separate any part of Chinese territory from China. And another favorite form of words is Complete reunification of the motherland must be fulfilled and definitely will be fulfilled. And backing up these statements has been a very rapid military build-up so that China now has the largest army and, the, and navy in the world and the largest military aviation force in the Western Pacific. 
defence spending is also growing rapidly. While China's economy is currently growing probably around about 3% per year, the publicly released defence budget is growing at well over double that rate. This year, defence spending is rising by 7.2%. In recent months, China's military mobilisation laws have been rapidly updated. Mobilisation staffs have been activated throughout the country. Mobilisation exercises are being conducted. And there are reports that many state-owned and private companies have been ordered to prepare for the emergency production of military-related goods. Then Xi has recently elevated the junior general uh, who has led China's planning for military operations in Taiwan to be one of his two most senior military advisors in the Central Military Commission. Xi Jinping has also substantially modified China's development programs by stating that defence and security needs must have equal or even higher priority to the goals of economic growth and infrastructure modernisation. He calls this, and I quote, integrating national strategies and strategic capabilities. Self-reliance is at the heart of Xi's powerful drive in the Made in China 2025 campaign, the dual circulation concept, the civil military fusion policy, the so-called new development phase, and also the vast government spending to develop cutting edge technologies and modernize civilian infrastructure. The economic cost of these policies has been huge probably reducing China's economic growth rate by some 1% to 2% of GDP per year. But Xi has been determined to insulate his party state from external coercion and prepare the country for the possibility of major war. Yet another indicator of Beijing's preparations um, are the PLA's frequent penetrations of Taiwanese air and sea space. And some of these operations have been assessed by security analysts to be rehearsals for particular phases of a military assault on Taiwan. And then we should also note China's construction of full-scale replicas of key Taiwanese government buildings and other installations and the training of PLA regiments in assaulting these facilities, this particular uh, one is the Taiwan's uh, a replica of Taiwan's uh, presidential offices. There's also replicas of things like the Taiwanese foreign ministry and so on. China's rocket force also practices strikes against American and allied bases in Japan and Guam by firing missiles into full-size replicas that have been constructed in China's deserts. And here, uh, this actually shows only part of uh, of the picture, but um, there are uh, distinct similarities between the configuration of some of these targets, part of which you can see with the ship targets uh, towards the bottom, I think, um, and the, the Yokushika naval base in Japan. And as some of you would know, um, there is also available um, a major, well, let's say, it's a video that the Chinese have produced uh, sort of showing fictional uh, air and missile strikes on Anderson Air Force Base in Guam. Um, and there are reports also, of course, that China is building more bomb shelters for its military and civilian personnel, particularly in the provinces adjacent to Taiwan. Yet another feature of China's preparations um, is its intense cyber information warfare and subversion campaigns against Taiwan. And of course, these penetrating, disrupting, dividing, undermining and corrupting operations are also being conducted in tailored forms against the United States, Australia, Japan and most other Western allies. Less than a month ago, Xi Jinping told his National Security Commission to be ready for what he called, and I quote, dangerous storms and to prepare for, quote, the most extreme scenarios, unquote. Senior US intelligence officials have sta stated to congressional committees that Xi Jinping has ordered the Chinese military to be fully ready to conduct an assault on Taiwan by 2027. In the face 
of these very active Chinese preparations, President Biden has been asked four times since his election whether in the event of a Chinese military attack on Taiwan, America would commit military forces to fight. And four times he has replied without hesitation that US forces would fight to defend the island. Indeed, he has occasionally referred to America's legal obligation, as he sees it, to do so under the Taiwan Relations Act of 1979. Now, my conclusion, and that of most others who follow daily what Xi Jinping and his colleagues say and do, is that war with Taiwan is certainly not inevitable. But it is actually a very serious risk that we really can't afford to ignore. We need to be better informed and we need to prepare, and hence the need for this book. A third reason to write this book is that a great deal would be at stake in such a war. Taiwan is, of course, a vibrant democracy of 24 million people in a strategically vital part of the Western Pacific. A successful Chinese invasion, uh, this shows um, part, that part of the world a bit from as though you were in Beijing, a successful Chinese invasion would punch a huge hole in the Allies' island chain defences in the Western Pacific and seriously undermine the defence of Japan, South Korea, the Philippines and America's own territories in the theatre. And if China took control of Taiwan, some analysts doubt whether Beijing would stop there. It might move on to seize other territories in the Western Pacific. The Allies also have a strong interest in ensuring that Taiwan's world-leading semiconductor companies that supply critical components for many Allied military and civilian systems don't fall into China's hands. In addition, Washington is well aware that if it gives way to Beijing's pressure and abandons Taiwan, huge damage would be done to US credibility and the entire American alliance system. All American allies would be forced to reassess the value of Washington's security commitments. And some would probably start looking for alternative means of security. A fourth reason uh, to write this book has been to correct the perception of many in the West that Beijing plans to fight such a war in a largely conventional military manner. Our early research showed that this assumption was false. China is planning to fight a much, um, such a war very differently um, to the largely conventional military approach of the United States and its allies. While Xi Jinping uh, would love to win a quick military victory and force the United States uh, out of the Western Pacific within weeks, Beijing's planners, in our view, consider this to be an unlikely prospect. So China's leaders are preparing to fight a long, draining and exhausting war that would probably progress through several phases that they believe would eventually force the collapse of American and allied political will. And the Chinese are planning to fight in many more domains than the US and its allies currently give priority. Of course, Xi Jinping and his colleagues know that the military domain will be important, but they expect to suffer heavy military losses and they consider other domains to be equally important. Let me explain briefly. While Americans and Australians currently believe that they are in a state of peace, the Chinese believe that they are already engaged in an intense struggle um, with the US and its allies that they consider to be a form of non-kinetic warfare that they usually call political warfare. That is why the Chinese have nearly a million people in, uh, organized in four central agencies of government, already inserting fake news stories, manipulating the Western media uh, to exacerbate divisions and tensions, working to influence political views and elections and conducting disruption, subversion and spying operations. When supplemented by widespread cyber intrusions to penetrate strategically important electronic systems, the scene is set for much more severe levels of disruption to Western decision-making in societies 
in future crises. Beijing is also working to weaponize supply chains and many other elements of economic leverage. Perhaps most importantly, the Chinese are planning to exploit their newly won dominance of global manufacturing. Now, let me just point out um, the red line here shows since from 2004 to 2019 uh, what has happened in terms of relative scale of manufacturing output. And the red line is where China's come from. The blue line below that is the United States in terms of manufacturing output. And the others you can probably see um, uh, below there are mainly the Europeans, Japan, and so on. This is of fundamental strategic importance, I'd suggest. Um, many of you may not be aware that American manufacturing output was more than double that of China um, early in the period, but by 2021, uh, China's manufacturing output had grown to about double that of the United States. This result is a result of policies that have been driven the effective export of America's industrial supremacy offshore and mostly to China. Australia and most other Western democracies have, of course, followed a similar path. Let me remind you that in 1960, Australian manufacturing generated 28% of our GDP, but it now contributes only 6% of our GDP. And we no longer make many strategically important products, including pharmaceuticals, many processed metals, most types of fertilizer, several categories of military munitions and many other things besides. By contrast, China manufactures more ships, steel and smartphones than any other country. And it is a world leader in the production of chemicals, metals, heavy industrial equipment and electronics. The basic building blocks, I'd suggest, of any military industrial economy. Critically, the United States is no longer able to outproduce China in advanced weapons and other supplies needed in a war. So the American industrial dominance that was so central to the Allied victories in both world wars is no more. And Beijing is planning to exploit this new industrial dominance in telling ways if there is a future war. Beijing is also preparing a range of disruption capabilities in space, in terrestrial communications and other strategic networks. The Chinese assessment is that America's greatest weakness is actually not its military or even its industrial decline, but its highly polarized and deeply fractured society. Xi Jinping believes that even if the US wins some military battles, China will not be defeated. He judges that when faced with the prospect of a long, drawn out, draining struggle with no end in sight, America's society would fracture. There would be massive anti-war demonstrations in the streets and Washington would be forced to negotiate a peace deal largely on Beijing's terms. Now this has major implications for how Australia and our allies are planned to deter and if necessary to fight such a war. Let me touch very briefly on a fifth reason for writing this book. This is a strong imperative we now have to develop a clearer sense of what such a war would actually be like. Um, and in particular, what would be the primary impacts on our society and those of our allies and friends? There are, of course, several possible ways that Beijing might try to seize Taiwan. But in my view, the most likely is a massive surprise assault, probably springing off what looks like a fairly benign exercise uh, that would aim to paralyze Taiwan's command and control systems capture key people and occupy vital installations within hours. Some of you would know uh, that prominent Chinese call this the quote, 14 hour option. In this initial phase of a major war, many of Chinese 1400 plus theater ballistic and cruise missiles would likely strike key targets, not only in Taiwan, but also in allied countries across the Western Pacific. Beijing would aim to win the battle for Taiwan before the United States and its allies could intervene with substantive force, substantial force. The fighting would likely be intense for the first three or four weeks at least, with both sides suffering significant losses. 
But before long, Chinese and Allied forces would start to run out of the most relevant munitions, and they may also run short of worthwhile targets in the immediate theatre. What would follow would likely be a long and draining struggle that would extend for many months and possibly for several years. The human costs would be huge, but so would be the economic and social costs. And all the Allies would need to mobilise their economies and their societies for what would be a total war, the likes of which we have not seen since the Second World War. For Australia and its allies, let me suggest this would be a huge shock. Our societies have grown used to sending military forces away to the Middle East, to Southeast Asia and other theatres to fight conflicts with life continuing largely undisturbed at home. But a major war between China and the United States would be completely different. This would not be a conflict that we could outsource to the military to go away to fight and win. Whether we like it or not, this war would affect almost everyone and we need to plan accordingly. My sixth and final a uh, major reason for researching and writing this book has been to figure out, well, what needs to be done. Let me simply list a few of the top priorities very briefly. On the military front, the United States and its allies need to strengthen, disperse and protect their military forces, their supporting bases and infrastructures in the Western Pacific, and that includes in Australia. We must ensure that our key military assets cannot be destroyed by a preemptive strike. And we must be able to apply powerful leverage to deter and help defeat even a major power. Second, we need to find better ways of protecting our media, key agencies, businesses and our publics from Chinese political warfare operations. Third, our international supply chains uh, for critical goods and services must be reconfigured to shift production to Australia, our allies, and other trusted partners. And we need to do this soon. And fourth, the allies must strive hard to restore their dominance of world leading manufacturing. This actually is possible, but it will require serious industrial reforms, a dramatic rise in productivity and international competitiveness and new levels of business cooperation between the Allies and other trusted partners. If we move quickly and decisively in that space, there actually are some exciting possibilities, particularly for this country. So there are my six main reasons uh, for writing the book. Uh, I personally consider them fairly compelling, obviously, that's why I wrote the book. But I hope that you see them also as being very good reasons to actually read the book. And so over to you, good reading, and please join the discussion. All right, uh, thank you very much, Ross. That was a, a great introduction. Of course, you do need to read the book to get really into the, the substantive issues and the the data and the evidence. It is a, a thoroughly well-researched book uh, and, and all of Ross's arguments are, are very well backed. I would like to now ask our special guests to join us, please, up, up on the platform. Uh, Kim Beasley and James Patterson, if you don't mind me using first names for brevity tonight, that would be super. Thank you. All right, we might give, uh, give Ross a, a break and a chance to have a drink of, a drink of water and, and, re, and recruit. Um, Perhaps I'd just like to, to see if there are any immediate uh, responses or reactions that either of you have to what Ross has just said. Hello, Hal. <laughs> no, um, terrific. Uh, I really look forward to reading the book. It's a it's the canary in the cannot coal mine type book which societies need every now and then to get and uh, and to contemplate what it really means. Um, it's uh, uh, you've done a, a sort of exemplary open source intelligence performance. 
That, that's what this is. I was always impressed when I was ambassador to go to uh, Hawaii. And um, there in the, uh, I always call them SyncPAC's headquarters, PACOM's headquarters, mm. there is a unit specifically devoted to analysing open source material from China. And the argument as to why they thought it was necessary to do it is that the, the Chinese Communist Party is such a behemoth, the Americans would say, or behemoth as I would, and um, it, that it can't actually communicate you know, itself with the appropriate level of urgency and priority. It can't keep in touch with the membership. So the party establishes in the minds of uh, all their factotums spread across the country uh, what is the priority what is the line what is the the direction of their thinking about problems how do they think they're going to overcome those problems what are the duties of uh, uh, of all chinese to their minds uh through open source and and quite clearly you've been able to pick up a lot from that habit that they've developed so this has to be taken very seriously. Uh, it's good intelligence minds, as Ross himself has, uh, applied to what is very much available for those who are prepared to apply their minds to it. So that's the first point I want to make. The second point I want to make is that um, all those lines that you see on uh, you know, growth in Chinese manufacturing, growth in this or that aspect, they are not endlessly upwards. In fact, China is now running into lots of problems. Mm. And, um, but the problems themselves may add urgency to that timetable. That's the problem with the problems. Mm -hmm. I, the, I, I'm a bit of a, uh, a reader when I can of... Uh, a bloke named Yi Nanjing. Uh, Yi Nanjing is a obs and gyny man who is actually a big data man. He's now in his late 80s and he's no doubt on his way out. But he wrote a book in 2007 called um, Big Country Empty Nest, which was promptly banned in China and then it um, and then was released by the Chinese uh, in 2013 when the Global Times described it as possibly the most important book written in China this year. That was six years on. And, um, the, uh, and the line that he was pursuing was interesting. It, back in 2007 when he wrote it, the Chinese were saying, we'll be four billion people by 2050 and everybody will bow before us. He said, no, if you're lucky, you might be about 1.2 or 1.3 uh, and you'll be on your way down. And um, he, uh, he sort of... He points out lots of things. This is not one of his figures, but uh, about 43% of Chinese pregnancies end in abortion. But the thing with that is it's the basically aborted females. And uh, if you go to other countries, the US has a high rate of abortion. It's 17. And the rest of us, Japanese, South Koreans, Taiwanese, Australians, we're about between 10 and 13. And we're not gender specific. They are gender specific in uh, in the, those practices and uh, the Chinese have now discovered that um, uh, women have collapsed on them and going down uh, collapsing alongside that is the young people young men in particular and uh, you saw how Xi reacted to young men after the last party congress uh, when the young men said Right, you made your big speech on shutting us down for COVID. Keep this up and we'll burn you. And um, so he didn't. He didn't keep it up. And um, so he, he moved away from it. Um, Chinese replacement rate is now about 1.3. It says, who oh knows, says uh, Mr. Yi, more like 0.7. Now, 0.7, you're off the cliff. You're gone. So uh, that's possibly not so. But at 1.3, it's total disaster. 2.1 is replacement, not big migration. But we're at 1.8, but we make up for it in migration. In the case of China, they don't have that. So you've got a, uh, you've got a, a, a set of stats, which the Chinese are now admitting to, um, 
Yi says their populations are hundreds of millions smaller than it actually is. They have finally said, even though we said we keep growing to 2030, we're not, we're going backwards now. And um, that's 10 years before the UN said that would happen. Nobody notices this, but both the UN and, and they agree, the party leadership agrees, that China will be a country of about 780 million by, uh, by the end of this century, which would be a sort of ratio of retirees to workers of about one to one. And um, the uh, and he again says, helpful fellow, no, about 380 million, maybe smaller than the US. So this is, this is not a small moment, a small matter. It means trouble, long-term trouble. Not trouble right now. It means China will need to be the major AI country in order to be able to actually produce anything. And so it, uh, it probably will be. So you, you've got that running uh, as a problem. You've also got the economic problems at the moment where um, the domestic consumption has not made up for the fewer exports. So the economy is going backwards as well. So the question then arises, is that enough? Is what they have done to this point enough to secure those objectives? Maybe it is. Um, and uh, and if, if she wants to do it by 2027, that's probably the outer point of the availability to him of a capacity to do that. So what worried me enormous, I only read the speech, I haven't read the book yet, but I presume the speech and the book are the same. What, what really worried me about that was that the way in which it's presented is they may have actually reached a point where they might be able to do it. And, uh, and certainly they may be reaching a point of some desperation to do it. Um, which finally brings in the concept of deterrence, which Ross deals with, and which we have ceased to think about in a sophisticated way. Deterrence we think of in terms of nuclear balance of the Cold War. Deterrence now has to be thought about differently, and Ross clearly does think about that differently. But uh, the government says that that's what its policy is, and that's related to developments in missiles and weapon systems that we want here, that it'd be able to, their capability of deterring attacks. Outside the use of nuclear weapons, I've never been a great believer in deterrence, <laughs> but um, I, I think deterrence certainly works if you have society obliterating machines to be deployed. It doesn't, doesn't change people's minds in other circumstances, I don't know. I, I Very hard to calculate. Uh, it's a good thing for me that I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for, for that. Senator Patterson, James, if I may, would you like to, to respond also? Thank, thanks, Beck. I think it's important to reiterate a point that Ross made uh, in his introduction, which is that no one on this panel, and I imagine no one in the audience, is enthusiastic about the prospect of conflict in our region. Uh, Australia's interests are very clearly best served by the preservation of the peaceful status quo in the Indo-Pacific. And everything we sh should do in the next five, 10 and 20 years should be about how we can best contribute to the maintenance of that status quo and help prevent the outbreak of war. Um, I take the view that most strategic analysts do, which is that the best thing we can do is make the most meaningful contribution to deterrence, along with our allies and friends, to try and ensure that this war never happens in the first place, rather than we have find ourselves in a position of having to respond to it. So what is it that you need for deterrence? Firstly, you need to know who you are deterring. Mm -hmm. Secondly, you need to know what you are deterring them from doing. Thirdly, you need to know what their capabilities are. Fourthly, you need to know what capabilities we need to counter their capabilities. And finally, you need to know how to clearly communicate your intent to them about that. And what Ross's book does is it answers every single one of those questions. And it does so to a profoundly sophisticated level of detail, more detail than I have ever seen in an unclassified document. And that is a tribute to his knowledge and the work that he put into this and the people that he sought advice and input from in, in putting forward that book. It really comprehensively assembles the best open source information we have about these problems and what we need to do. And so it's a very useful template. 
I just want to highlight one other thing, which is um, I found particularly relevant for me and my responsibilities in home affairs and cybersecurity, but which I think is a challenge for all of us to be worrying about and thinking about. And that is uh, Ross's insights into political warfare or information operations that are taking place in the cognitive domain. Because the thing about these operations is that they always precede war, sometimes many, many years before war. And what they're designed to do is to shape our decisions and constrain our options long before we ever arrive at the point of making those decisions. And we can all see uh, today evidence that those are taking place right now today against Australia. And we need to do much more to step up to that fight and up to that challenge. Uh, the previous government initiated a, a great series of counter foreign interference uh, reforms which have had a really big impact but my view is there's much more work to do in that space we are far from being on top of that challenge as much as we need to and if we don't get on top of that we will find ourselves in a place where our options have been constrained and artificially limited and we won't be able to have the full freedom of action that we might wish to have as a nation when we come to that point of contemplating those very difficult decisions Excellent. Uh, thank you so much. Now we will open to the floor for questions. I've got a couple more that are that I'd like to to, um, to put to to the panel. But please start thinking about the questions that, that you might want to ask as well. I'm going to jump actually to what was uh, a little bit further down my question list, but we've we've got to it, so I'm, I'm going to go there myself. Political and economic warfare are, are types of warfare that we're not used to talking about, at least not in the terms and to the extent that you cover them in the book cross. How do we start to normalise these kinds of discussions? And why is it important to do that, to bring the Australian people along and also Australian businesses um, and to help expand this, this conversation? And I might start with you then, Ross. <clears throat> One of the things that uh, the book emphasises is that this actually goes right back um, to Sun Tzu, you know, 500 BC, you know, um, winning without fighting. Um, and the whole concept of weakening the opponent intensively through subversion, undermining, uh, weakening in all sorts of, using all sorts of tools before the military even go to the field, into the field. Um, and that's something which is deeply etched, I argue, in the book, um, in China, the Chinese approach to crises and security. Mm. What we're seeing at the moment, of course, as the Senator has just said, is, is a lot of this activity now. Um, that's not to say that necessarily going to be um, I'm fighting a war, but it's certainly preparing the, 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 if you like, the battle space mm. writ large and giving them options uh, to make life extremely difficult for us. They're already complicating our lives now, uh, but make it extremely difficult if they choose to turn things off in different ways to um, further complicate all sorts of things. Um, uh, and uh, if you like, clear the way for us to weaken and, and be more vulnerable to other operations. Um, what can we do about it? Um, I think uh, there are people, as the Senator is a leading member of this in Parliament and others outside, who are thinking deeply about this um, and, and what can and should be done. One point, let me just emphasise, um, and that is most of the things that I believe need to be done in the current circumstances is I think we need to um, bring the public, uh, I really mean all elements of the public, um, into the fold and understand what's going on. Uh, one of the things I've been doing in the last few years, and some some of the key agencies, I'm not going to go into detail here, are also doing similar things, is briefing company boards and other, mm. other community organisations on what's actually going on in the re up in the up in mm. up in the region, and not, not surprisingly, quite a bit about what China's doing. My experience with that, having now been doing it to some very big companies and here and to some extent in the US, is that the response is almost universally the same. Um, a, uh, they're really interested. B, the first question they ask is why weren't we told before, earlier? C, what can we do about it? Um, and how can we help? Um, and they're not necessarily looking for contracts. Um, and my, it's really rare, in my experience, to have people who fight against it and say, oh, that's all rubbish. Because what you're doing is just presenting the facts of what's happening. You saw some of them tonight, and there's a lot more in the book. So the point I'm really making is we've got to do more of this. Mm -hmm. and, we've, and governments can do some things. Um, uh, other agencies, other organisations in not-for-profits and so on can do a lot more, perhaps. 
Uh, I think it needs to be a bit of a national effort. But I think the Australian, my personal view is, and I think the history shows it in polling, uh, going right back to before the first, Second World War, I suggest that the Australian public can cope with this sort of stuff. It's just that they get upset, and rightly so, if they don't, haven't been told. And I don't think we're doing a great job of telling them yet. Thanks, Ross. I, I do have to say, Ross, um, I think that's a very general, excellent description of the boards of companies on the East Coast. Mm. I don't think you'd quite get the same the joyful <laughs> reaction in the West. But anyway, that's uh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. You would from the population in the West. Yep. Senator Patterson. There are some things that we need to do that are about refining the existing agenda and policies that are out there. In my view, the foreign influence transparency scheme is not being complied with uh, sufficiently. There are people that we all know that are out there today that are engaged in covert influence on our democracy that are not appropriately disclosed. And there are reforms that need to be done to give the Attorney General Department the resources and the powers to prosecute that case and, and get them on there and bring into public light, as Ross says in his book, with the disinfectant of sunlight, those activities so that a Australians who observe it can properly price in where those people are coming from. I think there's um, some challenges we've got in the enforcement of the espionage and foreign interference reforms of 2018, where only two people have been charged and no one has been convicted in five years since that legislation was introduced. And this is at a time when ASIO assesses that foreign interference and espionage is at the highest levels in our history, higher than even at the height of the Cold War, and it has supplanted terrorism as our principal security concern. It is impossible to reconcile those two things. But then there's also a, a new frontier that we have to confront that um, the previous government wasn't able to and the new government now has to deal with. And that is whole new frontiers for foreign interference in our democracy, particularly in, in social media. Um, I'm leading a committee inquiry process at the moment. And I'm deeply concerned both by the successful weaponization of Western headquartered social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter and YouTube, but also the unique challenges posed to our democracy by social media platforms that are popular in the West, but headquartered in authoritarian countries mm. like TikTok and WeChat, which are subject to very direct control and influence by authoritarian regimes and the danger that that presents to our democracy. And then add on to that, the um, potential explosive accelerant on all of that of a generative AI and the implications that could have for our democracy because it is getting so good and will only evolve further that we can no longer really trust our eyes and our ears with the information that we're presented. We don't know if an image or a video or audio that we're presented with is real or whether it's been created by AI. And think about the devastating consequences that could happen if a, a bad faith actor, not necessarily a nation state, but possibly a nation state, was able to put together a convincing deep fake video of President Tsai Ing-wen declaring independence from Taiwan and that wasn't able to be very quickly identified as a deep fake uh, and responded to and or dismissed accordingly. Um, these are the kind of um, black swan risks that we face uh, in the coming years that we really need to step up to. Otherwise, I think we'll find a, a very corrosive effect on our democracy uh, and on regional uh, political stability. Yeah, thank you. Can you mention there's a there's quite a different view in the West, certainly in the business community, mm. and, um, you know, you, you could, I guess... Uh, imagine that many of the businesses that are seeking the kind of advice and the conversations are, are probably slightly more receptive to it than perhaps those are not, those that are not. Um, but, but, but what do you think? How do, how do we go about normalising this kind of conversation and how do we uplift the general awareness of, of what's going on? Well, in the case of the broader general public in Western Australia, it's probably more hostile to China than in the Eastern States. Um, it's a different, two different phenomena that we're dealing with there. And um, basically, just mountainous stuff is sent from West Australia to China, huge amounts. I mean, you wouldn't think that by tonnage, the biggest port in the world is Port Hedland. And uh, that is all a product of humongous amounts of iron ore and some other stuff, just heading in the in behemoth of boats up to uh up, up to china um and an awful lot of what was banned has got itself back into china I mean, the funniest case is barley which west australia produces a huge amount but it's the best barley for beer in the mines of chinese so the chinese have started to uh brewers have started to use um uh, the the tariffs that are put on, humongous tariffs 
that are put on Australian barley, like a GST. So they um, they pay the penalty on the way in and then claim it back as they export their beer. So it's... Uh, and, and then all of a sudden an awful lot of West Australian lobster has started to abandon the West Australian coast and reappear in Vietnam, apparently. <laughs> and, um, and so uh, it, it departs there into, uh, into the place. Look, I, I think that what's enormously useful about what the Senator's saying, what, what Ross is saying, is that when you, when you sit down and think through the, the consequences of the argument that Ross is making, uh, 30 or 40 percent of the battle is shining a light. Mm -hmm. And um, because it, it, the response is not too difficult uh, once the light is shone. Um, it, it's well within the, ca the capacities of the society to counter it and to, and to start to do things which offset it. Now, the hardest thing for us, this is the hardest thing I find now to accept is that when I was Defence Minister, we defended the country. Um, we had about 2.5, 2.6% of GDP being spent on defence. It was 10% of the budget. It's now 2, maybe going to 2.3, and it's about 7% of the budget. But what we were defending against was a set of capabilities identified in the region, and China was not supplying any of them, in which we did a force structure that could meet that, arguably meet it in a reliable way. And we bought the equipment, built the facilities, all the rest of it that would deal with the problem effectively. We then spent 30 years dropping the ball and, um, and not going on with it beyond the Cold War. We used to explain it when I was defence minister, got nothing to do with the Cold War, this absolutely nothing at all. No, it's, uh, it's totally related to the region. It's not related to Russians or anybody else. It's the region. Um, but everybody said at the end of the Cold War we'd get a peace dividend, and the peace dividend in Australia was the ability to defend the country and leave a sufficient baseline defence spend that would enable us to do it. The defence spend would be about 5 to $8 billion a year more for the last 30 years if we had actually sustained the rate and so, you know, you think of what extra we would have had, what our defence forces would be looking like if we had five to eight billion a year more being spent, and this year, even another five to eight billion being spent. So, uh, so what are we dependent on now? We are totally dependent on the United States, um, and that is that means that if we're going to deter this, that what what Ross is talking about, we're not going to deter it. It's going to be deterred by the US or nobody at all. And um, it's a, uh, and, and it's a bit embarrassing to have to concede that. The US now has worked out that they want, one, there's many good things to read in that, that report that's been published by the government. But I'd draw your attention to page 27. And I invite you to stare at the map as uh, Nietzsche warned against staring into the abyss. You know, at the end, says Nietzsche, the abyss stares into you. And, uh, but you stare into this map and then you will know what to do. That's, I, I said that to the officers of the 13th Brigade in Western Australia a couple of weeks ago. One of them rang me up a week later. I get it! Because <laughs> <laughs> what you, it's a totally different orientation on Australia. It's a global style of orientation, the, the, which, which actually makes almost all of Western Australia the front line. Uh, but look at what it's pointed at. The, the Americans are beginning to develop what I'd describe as a north-south perspective on China, which they've never had before. They've always had an east-west perspective. Mm -hmm. And they've always looked at Asia through the Confucian societies. And my argument with them, when we did things they didn't like, like going into the Chinese uh, uh, Asian Infrastructure Bank, as you fellows, you look at it through the Confucian societies. We look at it through the Southeast Asian societies, which are Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, Christian, and they all want us to be in it. And, um, they're, uh, and that pressure is substantial on us because that's how we see the world. It also points to the US at a southern part of China, 
which does not figure much in Chinese military preparations. So it's a uh, it, it's it, it, it's worth having a look at that, but also reflecting. So what does that mean for us? Well, it means the Americans want our bases. That's what it means for us. And so all those facilities that were developed in the context of the defence of Australia across the north of Australia are now exceptionally useful for the United States, and they made all the announcements on that at the last Osman meeting. So, um, but embarrassing. We are totally dependent on the US. And that is not because we have a natural tendency in that direction, it's just out of sheer necessity. Um, it is interesting that you that you bring up deterrence and, of course, the US in its national uh, security strategy as well as its national defence strategy has highlighted that its approach is, is one of what it calls integrated deterrence. And it's a, it's a position and a concept approach that they have worked towards actually for probably the last five to ten years. Mm -hmm. um, and while it certainly does have US forces and US military power at its core, Ultimately, that concept says we can't do this alone. We don't yeah. want to do this alone. That's it is right. undesirable to do this alone. And when you look again at those at those graphs, if you if you started to add to the US the the Europe line or the Western Europe line and the Japan line and the Germany line, you're starting to get to a position where you you're far more competitive, right? You've you've actually got you've actually got a fighting chance. And and to me, that's what integrated deterrence is, and the way that we need to think about deterrence is is how we how we come together with our allies and partners and, and what it is that we can uniquely contribute and how we can uh, we can participate in what is a, a comprehensive approach to deterrence. But um, on that, I'll just warn everybody, I am coming after this question to you, so, so please do be prepared, or else I can tell you wanting to say something, but I'm hoping I might get to, uh, sure, to, good, this, sure. to this question. If sure, it doesn't sure. let you answer it, please, please say what you need to say. Um, so the book takes a net assessment approach and I'd like to hear from all of you why from your perspective this is important and as defence looks to stand up under the DSR and net assessment capability within its policy centre for the first time really this kind of capability what do you hope this will offer the national defence strategy that's being prepared for 2024? Ross. Um. It's really important that we think beyond the, I mean, the military domain is really important, no question, very important, critical, but it's not the only one. And that's one of the big lessons. Uh, someone senior actually that I met last week here, here in Canberra said to me that was the biggest lesson, um, that, that these other domains are not only critical, and we, in a sense that there's a sort of general understanding, but actually operational capacities in those spaces have got to be really swept up if we're going to be capable of doing what we're going to have to do in these other domains and then making it all mesh together. So net assessment is pulling it all together. And when you read the book, you'll see the, you'll be probably surprised how much economics is there. And some of you, in fact, I suspect the vast majority of you in the room will learn things you never knew about how the economy is actually working today in East Asia. There's a lot of mythology about that. And if you don't know that it's, mm -hmm. and, and how uh, supply chains and everything else is working today, what are they going to be like in a crisis, which is what the book also looks at? Mm. Um, you need to, we need to be capable in our society, and particularly in this town, mm -hmm. to, be, to be able to integrate all that and then be able to campaign plan across all domains with a full understanding, not just of the military and our stovepiping, but everything. Now, how do we do that? Well, we've got to do much better in strategic policy and in terms of, um, you know, it's got to be much broader than just military. And so uh, I'll, I'll leave it to others to discuss and, and, and contemplate what that might mean in terms of bureaucratic capacities and what needs to be done where. But let me say, having worked to, in a number of places in this town, as you, some of you would know, um, it cannot all be done from defence. Mm. There are some very bright people who can do a lot of great things there, um, but in fact they don't have the writ to do a lot of what is required to make this thing work. Mm. And we need to... And, just last thought, we need to do that, but also we need to develop, uh, you know, a lot is happening in terms of building the alliance relationships and partnerships internationally to work on these problems and elements of them anyway. We need to have new mechanisms to doing a lot more of that. Mm -hmm. hmm. Only by working together as a team can we overcome that industrial basis issue. 
uh, and a lot of other things besides, we can be much more effective and much more effective in deterrence when we do more in that space. So we've got a lot of work to do to put the infrastructure in place to make that work uh, much, much better. And my reading from international partners that I've got is that most people in the region um, who are our friends are very, quite keen to get on with it. Mm -hmm. mm. Welcome to you, James. One of the great insights of uh, Ross's book is the point that if we're going to survive the next difficult decade or so that we confront is, is it's going to require a whole society effort. Um, there is no one part of society which can bear this burden alone and which we can rely on alone to help su successfully navigate it. That we need a lot more resilience in our economic and uh, system and in our society and that is both psychological and um, for the public at large and it's, it's our systems. It was a big part of the rationale of the critical infrastructure reforms under the previous government. That was a task of identifying what are the things which are systemically important to us as a nation, what are the things without which we could not operate, and what do we need to do now to make it more robust and resilient so that if it faces very serious threats, whether that's a cyber attack or anything else, that it is able to withstand that and that we can keep functioning uh, as a, a liberal democracy uh, under stress. Because it is very easy, it doesn't create require a very creative mind to imagine how a potential adversary as a prelude to a regional crisis would seek to destabilise or disrupt any of those critical systems as a means of causing us to be internally focused and distracted and then unable to come to the, ally, the aid of our allies or our friends or our interests or our values in the region. Um, these are things like our telecommunications network and our energy system and our logistics network and our ability to feed and clothe our people at a time of crisis. And a very sophisticated cyber attack could take out any of those. And uh, we saw what happened to our society during COVID when there was a shortage of toilet paper. Well, just imagine if um, <laughs> it was something more profound to the operation of our society. Um, and so there's a lot of work to be done and it's a private sector government uh, joint partnership to get it done. Yeah. Well, well I, I think the government will need to put, uh, they may well be inclined to, real meaning on the whole of government, whole of nation approach which is features prominently in the public version of that uh, of that paper because what the senator and what ross has been talking about is whole of nation mm. and uh so uh we need to i mean i uh, talked to the head of the, the head folk of the property council the other day and i said you might not think this includes you but you take a look at the issues of resilience on rebuilding damage and and on make sure, making sure that the facilities are appropriately housing folk and all the rest of it, you're in it. It's your job and, um, as, as part of Australian society that you do that. I, I really do have trouble with the concept of net assessment because in my mind it's firmly fixed as the mechanism you use to turn it, to work out whether or not one of your agents has been turned. <laughs> and um, it's a, uh, it's sort of, has uh, he done more damage and more good? If he's done more damage, then put him in prison. But the, um, let's say, uh, so, so this is new to me, doing net assessment in the, in the sort of military strategic context, but uh, it's, it's, it's important to do. It's really what Ross and others have decided to engage themselves in this debate have actually been doing for quite a while now um, because we have been aware that the, as the Soviets used to say, the correlation of forces in our region have been shifting decisively against us for 20 or 30 years. And that's it's a product. I mean, when I was Defence Minister, uh, the Australian economy was greater than ASEAN combined. Mm -hmm. Now Indonesia yeah. alone is going past us. Yeah. But that's, that's it. You know, I th and I think when, again, back then, Australia's GDP was probably about, uh, or China's GDP was probably about 30% greater than Australia's. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't even bother doing a comparison. So, that, I mean, that's a, that's a change in a, in a very, that's why they didn't feature in the, in the 1980s white paper. Why would you bother? So they weren't being, uh, they weren't trying to do anything. And then they, that's the... Uh, uh, so, and, and the thing that we have to be careful of here, there's a lot of people who want to talk with us on all of these matters. There's a lot of people in the region who want to see us actively engaged in it. There's not a lot of people in the region who actually want to engage themselves publicly, frankly. Mm -hmm. 
there is not a, a, a heart in it, with the possible exception of India, uh, to find themselves in a situation where uh, they're part of somebody's favourable calculation and net assessment on dealing with China. Uh, so, so we have to. We're um, we're pretty much the last bastion, mm -hmm. uh, but we're not down to the last bastion as yet. Yep. Uh, we may rapidly assume that position if Trump is elected president, uh, because I don't think for one minute Trump would intervene to defend Taiwan. Not for a minute. Uh, would Republicans? Absolutely, yes, but they're not the president. And um, it's a, uh, they would be spending all their time fighting him to uh, resume aid to Ukraine. Um, they would not have that much time to fight him, to make him do what he deeply, Trump is going to run on, he will run on, and it will feature prominently in his campaign, vote for me, no third world war. Mm. That is going to be a major Trump slogan, which he's already road, road tested a couple of times. So um, that's, a, uh, that's going to be quite an interesting thing for us to put up with. We have got to be, as a people, extremely tough uh, because we're, we're just, we just face, from this point on, non-stop challenge. Good thing we do have a reputation as Australians as being pretty tough. All right, I'm going to come um, to the floor. Can you put your hand up, please, if you'd like to ask a question? When you do, please identify yourself and your affiliation and please do ensure it's a question and not a statement. Um, as we get a mic to you, have we got mics, please? Um, as someone who comes from defence and loves acronyms, uh, whole of nation, you've won, whole of world, uh, wow. So uh, this, is, <laughs> this is why you want to try and bring it all together. Can we come over here, please, Marcus? Or, thank one you. More. Oh, one more. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> I shall plagiarise that, Mrs. <laughs> Hello, Matthew. Rob, thank you very much for your tantalising summary of the book. I look forward to reading it. Um, when we think of China's intent to take over Taiwan, there's a tendency to focus very much on the land and technological benefits that flow to China. It couches it very much as the return of the prodigal son to motherland. But more than the land, there's also the maritime element. Mm. And with Taiwan, China will control the Taiwan Strait. So my question is, to what extent do countries like Japan and Korea are concerned about China taking over Taiwan and their loss of control of the Taiwan Strait, both from an economic and strategic point? Really good question. Um, uh, the answer is, um, I think they're all concerned. Certainly Tokyo and Seoul are, are very concerned, but they express their concerns in, even in private and in rather different ways. Uh, and they're doing things a little bit differently too. One of the things they are very, very worried about, though, is that if Beijing takes Taiwan, they're worried about, like all of us would be, about, well, what does that mean for their alliance relationships with the United States and their Western alliance generally? That's one point. Second point, when you actually look at how the economies might be, might, it might be um, affected, especially if there's ongoing fighting, just re getting key supplies in and out of South Korea and, for that matter, large parts of Japan is not going to be a trivial task. Um, uh, on top of that, if you start, for those who in the room, and I know there's quite a few of you, uh, with a sort of strategic military background, think carefully about what it would mean for the defence of Japan, including the Southern Islands, which of course mm -hmm. the, the closest is only a few kilometres off, uh, off Taiwan, um, what it would mean for the defence of Japan. And our interest in making sure that none of those countries, Japan and Korea, South Korea in particular, fall over. Mm -hmm. And certainly not the Philippines either. Mm -hmm. So. You know, you've got, to, you've got to think about this um, r r rather sort of, uh, and, it, and the maritime areas are critical. Uh, and if you look at what China's done in the South China Sea and essentially trying very hard now to convert the South China Sea into what they would see as an internal sea. Mm. Uh, I can, and they already say that um, in some of the, a lot of their internal debates, they, they talk about um, the Taiwan Strait essentially being um, territorial waters, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. So that, that's clearly their aspiration. 
the closure of the Taiwan Strait itself to Japan and and South Korea would not be that critical. Mm. But it, but if China controls the whole of Taiwan, that's that's a big big change. Mm. And I don't think many Australians fully understand the strategic implications from that. They're profound. Mm. Did either of the other panelists want to add anything on on that one? No. Okay. No, you um, always got to remember that Taiwan is half the size of Tasmania. Mm. With the population roughly equivalent of, of oh, Australia, yeah. yeah. It's Australian yeah. population in, in half Tasmania. It's a horrible thought. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to, Mike, I'm coming to you. Can we please have a, um, a microphone to Mike? I'm just going to quickly sneak one in from online that's been sitting here for a while from Rob. Uh, I'm interested in, in Ross's views, but, but um, the panel, please do chip in on this too. On the recent Defence Strategic Review and the government's response, is what was recommended and what was agreed by government the right stuff to equip Australia to play its part in any potential future war, as you describe? Um, I think on the military side, a lot of the right judgments probably are there. My biggest single concern, and there are others, but the biggest single concern is whether the funding is going to be there. Mm. Uh, look at what's happened in this latest budget and look at the projections for the next three years in capital. Now, capital, for those who are the uninitiated, not used to looking at defence budgets, is, is essentially what you're buying for the defence force, including facilities. And, um, and, and the, you can see that the projection shows no growth, in fact, a slight decline in capital expenditure over the coming three years. Now, as I wrote in a piece for The Strategist just a couple of days ago, this shows no sense of urgency on the part of ministers. Mm. I'm very, very concerned that we will find ourselves very quickly, we could find ourselves, and I agree with Tim Beasley's <laughs> comment, Gigi, there are signs that Xi Jinping thinks that the window is closing for them. Yeah. And the temptation for them to go sooner rather than later is real. Mm. And, I, and the reason I'm saying that is because we follow his speeches every day. Mm. And you can see it. And you can see it in, in what we can see in terms of glimpses we get of the internal debates, including some of the other leaders. Mm. So the point I'm really making is we should not trivialise this. This is really serious. And I do not see the budget reflecting really any serious urgency. Mm. And that worries me greatly. And it worries me on the behalf of everybody here, but actually on, on the part of our friends too including mm. in Southeast Asia, but also our American other allies. Mm. Yeah, I agree with Ross. There's a lot to like in the DSR, and I think Sir Angus Houston and Stephen Smith did a very good job within the constraints that were imposed upon them, but that's a pretty big and pretty important caveat because the constraints that were clearly imposed upon them is find a way to make this work under the existing funding envelope uh, given to defence. And that just doesn't match the seriousness of the rhetoric in the DSR on the threat environment that we're facing. If it really is, the worst and most serious strategic circumstances since World War II, it doesn't have the funding to match. And although the government does say there will be increases in defence spending in the medium and long term outside the forward estimates, as someone who was recent in, recently in government but is no longer, never ever believe a politician who says they're going to increase spending after the forward <laughs> estimates uh, because you never have to prove it. You never have to say where it's going to come from. You never have to acquit it. The whole purpose of you know, the honesty that is imposed upon governments of a four-year budget cycle is you have to show where every dollar is coming from and where it goes and if it's going to be offset by it elsewhere. And at the moment, um, we have a very, very tight constraint imposed on defence that I don't think reflects um, the danger that we face. There's no money. I remember when I was finance minister, people had come in when you're the chief prosecutor and none of the other ministers around the table want to ring you, see you, talk to you. Um, my phone went absolutely dead the moment I became finance minister. <laughs> and, the, um, and I used to say people had come in with wonderful submissions, They had, uh, particularly in the health area, and you'd say... Um, yes, the programs that you have proposed, the monies you've calculated for them are correct. The number of public servants you'll need to do the task and uh, whether you've got sufficient of them already or you'll need more to be added, you're absolutely right. I agree with that. The proposal you make is absolutely necessary for our society. There is no money. And the uh, we, we do about, oh, I did see a figure of 23, but... We do 25% uh, of GDP in the federal public sector. Add the states, 11, that takes us to 36. Go to the United States, it's 25% of GDP in the public sector. Add the states, it's 13, they go to 38. They do more public spending in the US than we do here. Um, in, in the case of the United States, the big money that goes on um, the Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, Defence. So those are the big programs. 
Um, all the rest is leverage. So unemployment benefits. Uh, the, the federal government pays half your unemployment benefits for 12 months. The states pay half for 12 months and then desperately try to cobble together money if you're unemployed for longer than that. Um, and you can go right through the American uh, fiscal stance and you'll find that basically what they do is it's a food stamp program or it's this, you know, it's a, they're, they're tiny things. And the Americans are always saying to me, you've got to get to 2% of GDP. Well, we have. We are actually now spending at the level the Americans want, and that is more than most NATO countries are doing, except for the French and the British. But um, I, I used to point out that, well, boys, you've done pretty well, but let me tell you what we do with our 25%. We pay for all the universities. Uh, we pay for the one third of kids who have to be in private schools and 10% of the kids who are in government schools. We pay for that. We pay supporting parents' benefits, you know. Uh, for uh, for people who are supporting parents but don't have other forms of employment. I could have said now, and we've also got the uh, the NDIS that, uh, that we pay for, and that's before we really get on the same sorts of things you do with leverage with the states. So it, it's, every time a defence minister comes before an expenditure review committee, he is the most hated profile in front of the government at that point of time. I had it easier than most, so I didn't actually have a committee that I reported to. And um, so uh, I only took about three or four big items, uh, like submarines or frigates or whatever, uh, to the cabinet and the rest of the... So now you have to take 100 million, you have to take to the cabinet. Uh, then 100 billion was just my small change. So um, we didn't actually have to do it then. But then compare us with others. So we've just said, this is us compared to the states. Okay, Maggie Thatcher and David Cameron absolutely slashed the public sector in Britain, 43% of GDP. You've got Germany fanatical about deficits and all that sort of stuff, 48% of GDP. France, 52% of GDP. And the people with whom we like to compare our social benefit, the Scandies, mid-60s. There is no money. And uh, so we have got to um, reprioritise in a way. Well, back in World War II, 34% of GDP we were, 70% of the budget. And we actually did make a pretty fair fist of defending ourselves. We are so far from home. We are such a long way from home. And um, it's difficult to see, except what I do hope to hear is that anybody who is actually calling for a tax cut beyond those that are out there already, kick them in the ass. Because <laughs> <laughs> we cannot afford to survive uh, with, uh, with, with the situation that we, we confront now. In, in, in public finance. Mike, can I go to you, please? Hi, uh, good evening, and uh, thanks for uh, the book. I'm looking forward to reading it. Uh, the, the question was knowing who to deter. So this goes to what's the focus of, of the deterrence? If Xi Jinping wasn't there, would that, that intensity of intent evaporate? If not, and it's all about him, then what is going to really change the calculus in his mind? Mm -hmm. What will be the things that really get to um, i try and be very quick so we can get a number of questions, hopefully. Look, it's it's really, um, Xi Jinping has really laid down the law. He's completely, significantly different to his uh, immediate predecessors, of course, in terms of his priorities and his insistence on some of these things. Um, uh, and he's been very... Um, assertive in pursuing them. Um, he, if you can't change his mind or deter him, then you're stuffed, frankly. Um, and and his writ is, when I say writ is law, I kid you not, because they write law for out, straight out of his office and, and his associated agencies. And not only they write law, but they actually um, adjudicate um, major criminal cases and decide who's guilty and who's not. Um, not anything polite like judges and juries. Um, so the point I'm really trying to get at is you're going to have to convince the senior leadership mm -hmm. or hopefully downstream there might be someone different. But exactly who they're going to be and what they'd be like, we don't know. 
and um, it's really interesting. One, one thing I was reading only just uh, 48 hours ago uh, was some of the new members that have been put into the Politburo and who they are. He's putting a lot more technocrats in, a lot of engineers <laughs> and people like that. I think partly because I think he worries about his internal security and potential rivals. And so the last point from me is, which is a, a frankly pretty big topic in its own right, we rightly and understandably tend to focus on the external to China. You know, what are they going to be doing? He's focused, sure, on that to some extent, but he's even more concerned about threats to himself and his family and his, his immediate interests and those around him and the CCP's future. So we tend not to focus enough on that as well and understand that. So when he's deciding whether he's going to operate against Taiwan, I do not rule out the possibility if he's facing the sort of internal problems that Kim rightly mm -hmm. pointed to, you know, he yeah. really might go soon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if he might go soon, primarily partly because he can see, you know, international opportunity, but even more because he feels pressed to do so mm -hmm. to hold the country together himself mm -hmm. around him and rally to him. Mm -hmm. Don't rule that out. We've seen that in, in some other crises in the, in the last 150 mm -hmm. years. We might see it again. Just very quickly, there's an interesting academic debate, particularly among China watchers, about the extent to which Xi Jinping represents continuity or change from his predecessors. And I think the weight of evidence is with those who say he represents an acceleration of an agenda which was pretty clearly set down by his predecessors, and he hasn't deviated materially from it. Perhaps he's going to get there quicker or more aggressively, but there's no reason to believe that he has a different end state than anyone else. And Rush Doshi's book, The Long Game, uh, really helps, I think, flesh this out with really good primary sources as to, to that agenda. But let's say for argument's sake that um, Xi Jinping uh, leaves office tomorrow and is replaced by someone who's outwardly much more benign and much more peaceful in their intent. Um, that shouldn't give us much comfort at all because, as we all know, intent can change in an instant. And what doesn't change in an instant is capability. Mm -hmm. And all of the effort to build up the military capability that China has engaged in over the last 30 years will not evaporate with a change of leadership. So really, we wouldn't be able to rest on our laurels at all, even if we get what we think is uh, an easier person to deal with than the incumbent. Mm -hmm. And then James beautifully and succinctly described the core elements of deterrence earlier. Um, but another objective of deterrence, and, and you, can, you can win just by complicating the picture enough for the enemy that they become a little bit confused and the task is just that much harder. And again, that is where you, you see this patchwork of nations and, and different approaches coming together. It is, it is effectively making the target much harder, right? So uh, that, is, that is also uh, one of the objectives of, of deterrence and it, can be, and it can be remarkably successful. Can I come over to this part of the room? Oh, good evening, fellow Canberrans. Uh, special good evening to Mr. Kimberly, um, uh, fellow Perth boy uh, in Canberra. Um, my kind of question is, so we see that China's building up a lot of capabilities, but is this really just the, what's the chance that it's a big house of cards that without the people behind it to operate it effectively, knowing how Chinese society works, there's a lot of mistrust between, um, you know, just people in everyday society, but also uh, among the politics, the politicians, the uh, Communist Party members, What's to say that because there's a lot of, uh, there's not unity uh, mm -hmm. in the nation, especially with the economic downturn, that mm -hmm. this war will be very effective. And, you know, um, just tying back to what uh, Ross said about the art of war, you know, Sun Tzu mentioned, started off with there are five things that you need to wage a successful war. And the first one is the way, whether people will fight with you, live and fight with you to the death. And uh, yeah, I would like to get your opinion on that. Mm. Look, a couple of quick points. It's a really big topic, but a really important one. You're right. Um, look, um, there are serious problems in China. And one of the things that's in the, it is actually discussed in some detail, uh, everything from the demographics, the birth rate, to right through to the problems in the economy and, and, and so on, et cetera. And, it, and some of them are getting worse. Um, uh, what, one of the things that is really troubling the leadership right now is the number of, is the percentage of the... Um, uh, 16 to 25 year age group uh, that are unemployed at the moment. And it's now reached 21%. And that's before the graduates coming out of universities and other hi higher education institutes mm. in the streets, which they will in the next two months. Um, and, and so they're very concerned about this. And because why? Because if there's going to be serious internal disturbance, they're the th sort of the people who, are, who, who could lead um, some disturbances. Of course, there are local disturbances pretty frequently, uh, but that's an issue. Um, popularity 
is a really interesting question to, to judge, and it depends on how you pose the question. If you look at the polling that we do have access to, what it shows is, and it's, and it's reflected to some extent in the response when Xi Jinping got up in the, in the National Party Congress last November, and, and, and the loudest applause, certainly within the party faithful, but beyond, uh, was when he recommitted, and, and again, in fairly aggressive terms, uh, the leadership to you know, re retaking or taking um, uh, Taiwan. Mm. So the point I'd make is, um, and then the other thing I'd say is, don't overlook the internal security systems and, and his tightening of those and everything from the social credit system to lots more. Mm. So there may be dissent. Um, uh, the actual, t the polling we see shows that support for the leadership in taking Taiwan is high. But I'm, you know, if you've got other data, I'm interested in seeing it. Um, and, but, but whether it would remain high if, if, the, if it actually became a, a major conflict is a, is a big question. Mm. And um, especially when they start running out of things. Mm. Because one of the things they're going to, I mean, their economy in a major war, in our view, would be far more impacted on than the United States or, or most other countries. Mm. Um, so, you know, a lot, it's, it's a really complex, complicated issue. And, um, but, and maybe some of these things are very relevant to the way uh, we can influence to the extent we can, how the leadership sees its options and how we can deter. Mm. Mm. Because I do believe that um, Xi and some of the people around him are at least as concerned about the domestic issues as they are the international. Yeah, let's see. It's the hope you got. But um, that in reality, the Chinese are like everybody else. It's what's happening around the corner on the kitchen table that counts, mm -hmm. uh, rather than the, the very big picture. Oh, the Chinese people are, are very courageous and very smart uh, as a people, um, and they're. But they, and you can run security on them, and, and the security regime is so intense now <laughs> in, in China that. But people resist by uh, a million in a in a hundred passive ways. Mm -hmm. They just don't do what they're told. I mean, it's 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 a lot easier to to stop a woman having a baby than force a woman to have one. And um, the uh, and the women in China said, "You can all get knotted." That's uh, that's what their response has been. I, I get anecdotal stuff all the time. One was from a dinner with an admiral recently who's retired and he's, he's doing uh, supervision of people doing engineering PhDs. At, I think it's IEU, one of the Canberra universities. And he says, you know, it's funny that you should say that. I've got this Chinese woman who's one of my students. And she said to me, she said, I'm never going back to China and I'm never going to marry. And my five closest friends have agreed. And I've just shifted my accountant yesterday and um, the new one is married to a Chinese woman. And uh, she said, you're very lucky to get me because my best friend at school and I had agreed that we we're going to continue, to, they're not lesbians, they're gonna to continue to live together and we'll have cats. And uh, we'll both get good jobs and we will have fun, we'll travel, we'll be well dressed and, and, uh, and all the rest of it. And, the, you know, they, they were told they could have three babies or two babies, then three babies years ago. It hasn't had any effect at all. Mm -hmm. Marriage has dropped to the lowest level it's ever been since they started taking numbers. Mm -hmm. it's, it's down to about 6.5 per thousand. And it was uh, at peak thirteen point five, so it's and it's and it's continuing down, and the and the evidence seems to be that there's one of the things they've done is to make divorce harder, and they make divorce harder, and marriage becomes even more unpopular. So um, it's a uh, it, th these are humongous social problems. You know, when you've got 25 percent of your university students not able to get jobs what do you say to the blokes as they come out who can't get a job we've got an idea for you there's labor shortages out in the fields in the bush so why don't you go out there where there are no women at all and you go because all the women have left the villages and they're all coming into into the towns why don't you go out there and um you know 
plant the wheat yourself. Now that's the, um, there's just a, there's a lot of passive resistance around. That's a good point. Um, look, it's it's 7.30 and the senator has to go. He has a, had a date with a midwinter ball. Um, I didn't oh, get to the right. questions that I need to on, online. So <laughs> can I do a speed round one word answer is acceptable? Uh, from Peter, can the democratic countries who follow the rules-based order unite in using sanctions to cripple the Xi regime's ability to produce weapons? Uh, can it be done? Can it be done? Not completely. James. No, I agree. No. Mm -hmm. Nope. Thank you very much. <laughs> Drinks and canapes will be served out in the in the foyer. Please join me in thanking uh, our panel and Ross. <laughs>